Welcome to the teaching on parental inversion and substitute mate. These are concepts that we first heard about through John and Paula Sanford in their book, Transformation of the Inner Man. They've gotten incredible insight and revelation through the Bible, through Holy Spirit, through their prophetic gifts about how things that usually have nothing to do with a person's desire can impact them later in life. Meaning you're a child and you grew up in a home and things are unstable in the home through no fault of your own. Could be alcoholism, could be a form of mental illness. You just get born into a family where there's problems and situations that you did nothing to contribute to, but yet, as a child, you're forced to have to deal with it on a daily basis, many times not even feeling closely equipped to be able to know how to handle it. An example of alcoholism, that's an easy and dramatic one, although I certainly don't mean to minimize anybody who might be listening to this CD who did grow up in that kind of a circumstance, but for those of us who did not, and didn't experience it firsthand, let me just try to help you to understand how destabilizing it would be as a child needing stability and needing the ability to have a set of rules of how to tackle life. For a little child, the world is so complicated and big, and each day there's so many things that they don't understand about life. They need parents and a home life that's stable and consistent and has rules that are reasonable and enforced in a consistent way. Unfortunately, with alcohol or any kind of substance abuse, the rules keep changing. And when the rules keep changing, the child, three, four, five years old, just gets no grid to know which rule is the one that applies. Now, listening to these CDs now as adults, we, we do have a grid. We understand how life works for the most part. But for a three or four or five-year-old child growing up, they need lots of help in trying to gain perspective. When, when something happens to them, they don't have the perspective of time and experience and life to know that this is just a passing thing. For them, it could be a permanent thing. They don't know. So when we say parental inversion, you know, anytime you invert something, it's, it's opposite of the way it should be. It's when the child has to take on too much responsibility at too young of an age. And then when we say substitute mate, we're talking about an inappropriate mix of a parent dealing with a child in a way that was only meant for the spouse, but for many reasons could be due to a divorce or, or due to just major problems in the relationship between the mother and father, that either one of those parents, either the mother or father, interacts with the child usually the opposite sex, in an inappropriate way that is very damaging to the child. So not everybody has parental inversion and substitute mate that listen to these CDs, but part of the reason why we make this mandatory learning for people at King of Kings and those, especially those who want to be in leadership is because we need to have a heart of compassion for other brothers and sisters in Christ. And even if we haven't experienced a problem, a specific problem like performance orientation or parental inversion, we need to know what the other people that we're praying with and praying for and co-laboring with and even just sitting down in the fellowship hall and having a cup of coffee, we need to get God's insight into what some of the root systems are that created the trauma and the pain that they're in so that we can minister to them and that they can feel the love of God coming through us in an unconditional way. So Lord, we just pray right at the start of this CD that you would help us expand the tent pegs of our heart, whether we experience this problem or either one of these problems ourselves and we're suffering with parental inversion or substitute mate issues now, or whether it's more for insight into what other people have struggled with. We just pray, Holy Spirit, that you would soften our hearts and you would give us insight and revelation from heaven to, to come into the earth. Let your kingdom come and let your will be done here on earth as it is in heaven so that we can interact with one another in a way that's life-giving, that brings the fragrance of Christ, that, that cracks open the alabaster box of our lives so that others can be drawn to you and that no problem that anybody faces, just help us remember that no problem that anybody faces is beyond your reach like Corey Ten Boom said, no pit is so deep that you can't reach down and pull a person up from difficult circumstances or whatever affects those circumstances that they experienced in the past or still have it on their life today. We just pray that you would use us as change agents to bring healing and wholeness to people's lives that we come in contact with. And those that are hearing this CD, 
that have experienced these problems, that you would bring wholeness and change into their lives as well, that they might experience the fullness and the abundant life that you have for them. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so we're going to keep uh, to our personal experience and what we've learned as pastors over the last 12 years I'm looking at this material at King of Kings Church in Basking Ridge, New Jersey. And we're also going to quote from John and Paula Sanford's book, Transformation of the Inner Man, and some other resources that we've tapped into over the years. But just want to say another debt of gratitude and thanksgiving that we have for the Sanfords for the amazing revelation that they've received over the years on all these different topics that we talk about. So quoting from the book, it says, Parental inversion is our term to describe what happens whenever one or both parents are so immature or ineffective or absent that a child takes responsibility to have to be a parent to his parents. That inverts the God-given order. Part of each parent's task is to provide a secure home in which a child can be free to be a child. Parents are to care for children, not the other way around. Chores and responsibilities are good for training children, but the weight of care and responsibility for the family should rest on the parents' shoulders, never on the children. In John chapter 14, verse 18, Jesus said, I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. An orphan is worth looking at for a minute. The customary understanding of that word orphan is well known to be that of children deprived of their parents. But in the Greek, the force of that Greek word is rendered comfortless in the King James Version. Perennially inverted people often report with pride and joy how in their childhood they took hold of their family when their family needed them. They stepped up. They took on a leadership position, even though they might have only been 9 or 10 or 11 years old. They stood up and met the need. And they're proud of that now as adults. John and Paul say, well and good. Far better that trouble should arrive in an adult by the root of a child's over-serving than he should fail by selfish unwillingness. So nobody's arguing the fact that it was great and noble that the child stepped up when the need arose, but... There's so much negative collateral that comes along with that decision. And John would point out, nevertheless, he says, sin is involved when a child steps up into that parenting role. And we need to help the adult that we're speaking with, and if it's you, help you understand what that sin was in order for you to be set free. Our hearts are never pure, no matter how noble the service, no matter how pleased that everyone might have been that a member of the family, this child, has stepped up, and no matter how much our Lord wants to reward that servant, that child, for trying to honor his parents by serving, the sin side of our actions is still going to cause us to have to reap because of the law of sowing and reaping until that transformation occurs where we bring it to the cross and we come out the other side resurrected as a new creation and that sets us free. God sends Jesus that he may reward the servant and prevent destruction. That's what Jesus does for us. We take these sins, we take these structures to the cross. We cause them to die. They don't get fixed. They get crucified. And then we trust God to resurrect us on the other side of that cross coming out of that empty tomb, like Lazarus coming out of the tomb and having those grave clothes unwrapped so that we can be the free person and live that full dimension that he chose us to have. Insofar as parental inversion is sin, it has as its base the disrespect for failing parents. You'll hear us talk about this a lot in Exodus chapter 20 when we read about the Ten Commandments that Moses received directly from the Lord. Honor your mother and father is one of the Ten Commandments. It says in the New Testament, quoting Paul, he said that it will go well with you. It's a commandment with a promise. Honor your mother and father that life will go well with you. The implication being that if you didn't honor your mother and father, life will not go well with you. Specifically in that area where you did not honor your mother and father, life will not go well for you in that area. So what John is saying now about parental inversion is that at its base, the sin that we have to repent for is disrespect for failing parents. It's good if a child tries to honor and respect his parents, but no one can keep their heart completely free from disappointment and hurt and judgment and resentment and disrespect. If you're that 9-year-old, that 10-year-old, that 11-year-old child who's having to step in and take care of your younger brothers and sisters, and, and you're looking at one of your parents who's passed out on the couch because they've had too much to drink again, 
you can't help but have resentment for him in your heart and disappointment. You're being robbed of your childhood because you're being asked to do something that no child should ever have to be asked to do. Whether a parent fails in place, in the example I just gave, sleeping on the couch because they had too much to drink, or they fail by being absent, which so many people have had to deal with as well, where a divorce occurred and the older brother had to step in and get a job after school or fill in a role that he wasn't yet equipped to handle. Whether a parent fails in place or by being absent, it's almost impossible for the child to avoid the sin of usurping, meaning they're stepping into a role that they were never created to fill, and they're usurping the role of the husband or the father if it's a young boy. He's taking over functions which belong to someone else, thus is in the position of usurpation, whether intended or not. All right, that's one point. Nor is it altogether possible to avoid the sin of not trusting God. So the first sin was dishonoring parents. The next one is being upset with God, and that's a sin, being angry with him, questioning, why did I get put in this family? You must not be a very powerful God. The child could be easily thinking, if you caused the situation and you needed me to bail out my family. Parents color God to their children. Little boy and girl, when they hear about God, the first person that they look at is their mother and their father, and they see God through the role that the parent plays. So that whether consciously or not, the child's picture of God begins to resemble failing parents in this situation. From then on, the child may not be able to trust in the reality of God, that he is on the throne and that he's in charge and that he's a good God. In the child's mind, this God needs help, and the world will fall apart if the child doesn't hold it together. Parental inversion robs a child of his childhood. It builds into children an inability to rest, and it rapes rest from then on. When the home is filled with unspoken tensions between the parents, one or more children take on the responsibility to try to hold them together. Once that stance is established in the child's heart, it may manifest a fear-filled attempt to hold life together inappropriately everywhere. So you could think if a child's young and still in grammar school and trying to put out fires at home between his parents, when he goes to school and there's an argument on the playground, immediately this trigger kicks in. And just to requote, fear-filled attempts to hold life together inappropriately everywhere. That child will overstep the boundaries on the playground and then try to parent those other children because he's been conditioned to do that. Once that child becomes an adult, that adult is not comfortable letting people disagree and fight things out in a healthy way. They might say, oh, I just can't stand it when people fight. Let's get this settled. Again, what's happening is they're getting triggered to something that they've seen happen over and over in their childhood. They don't realize that in their conscious mind as adults, unless they've dealt with these roots, and all of a sudden conflict arises on the job or in a family situation, or may need to step in and say, oh, I just can't stand it when people fight. Let's get this thing settled. So they'll try to quiet down the quarrels too soon, unable to trust that healthy dissensions are not a bad thing. That's what we normally do to work out conflict. But these folks are so quick to try to smooth things over or hold such a tight control that nothing really ever does get fully resolved. They may be compulsive peacemakers. Now that doesn't sound like a bad thing. Being a peacemaker is good. It talks about it in Matthew chapter 5, verse 9. But we can't let that principle be overdone to the point where it could be a sin. And others are going to honor them as peacemakers, which is good at a certain level. But when it's overdone, you could end up perpetuating a problem by validating the fact that the person is that peacemaker. But if they're doing it from an unhealthy base, we're not helping them because we're not realizing what's really behind that peacemaking. Parentally inverted people overwork and overachieve much like performance-oriented people. Only they are overworking from a different motive and a different base. If you remember performance-oriented people, the fear on the inside of them is that I'm only going to be loved if I work harder. My whole identity to the performance-oriented person is in what I do, so people will love me for what I do. So they overwork. Perennial inverted people overwork for a different reason. Their service is not to gain them acceptance or earn love. Their service is to keep the whole world from falling apart. 
They don't want that fear and that chaos that they experience as children when things are out of control to come back. So as soon as they see things starting to get out of control, they get triggered and they immediately want to go into that mode of trying to resolve the conflict too quickly. They may become far too busy and may often be heard to say, I don't want to let another person do it. I'd rather just do it myself because they're unable to trust that others will hold up their end of the bargain or do things in a proper way. Quoting John, he says, thus they may fall into being noble martyrs. That's a phrase that John uses often, noble martyrs, John Sanford, that is. Their stance is actually an unconscious insult to everyone else around them. The insult and the put down come from this unconscious anger in the child, now an adult, but anger as a child at the parents for not doing what they should have done. So when the adult, now parentally inverted person as an adult, talks to another adult and says, oh, you don't do it, I'll do it. The implication, the insult is, I'll do a better job than you will. Because this poor child was so used to having to take control of things all the time and being buttoned up, as people like to say, that they can't trust that if somebody else does it differently than they do, that it will be done well. So they need to do it themselves. Haven't we all witnessed how some people can be helpful in such a way as a person feels honored, but yet... The parentally inverted person helps in such a bustling and self-martyring way that the recipient feels dishonored and insulted. That's usually the parentally inverted child. In Luke chapter 10, verse 38, it says, Now it happened as they went that Jesus entered into a certain village, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. She had a sister called Mary who also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was distracted with much serving. She approached Jesus and said, Lord, Do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Therefore, tell her to help me. And Jesus answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you're worried and troubled about many things, but one thing is needed. And Mary has chosen that good part, which will not be taken away from her. So Martha is somebody we can think of in the Bible. Not that we know specifically that she was parentally inverted, but but displays that attitude of bustling, and over-serving to the point of resentment that makes it hard, very hard for other people to relax. Again, if you're taking these classes and listening to these CDs, I just want to re-emphasize the point that performance orientation and parental inversion have similar net results where the person is overworking, but the motive for the overworking is different. Performance orientation is to try to earn love, Parental inversion is to try to put everything in order because as soon as they see something out of order, they get pretty uptight about it and they need to do something about it. And that's the picture of Martha. So even on vacation, parental inverted people can't rest. John Sanford's testimony was even on vacation myself, I'd be in a vacation campground and five minutes after arrival, I'd be wandering around looking for somebody to help. And this is after a full year of being a pastor and a counselor of helping people. And when they're home, parentally inverted people learn not to let their guard down for a moment because of some spontaneous event might happen, some thoughtless act, one final straw is going to be added to an already overburdened load that they're carrying in their marriage. But little children don't fit in those kind of boxes. So if a parentally inverted person has their children, they want this order and this structure, but little children, when they're growing up, don't operate that way. They'd soon discover many things about themselves just by going through life in the school of hard knocks. And that self-control that the child needs has to come slowly. Self-control needs to arrive by a slow process of trial and error and inner decisions that that child makes, not from a parent who's overbearing and who's putting this compulsion out of fear because the parent just has this obsession about things being in order. Apparently inverted people usually can't relax and be refreshed in their home because in childhood, their home was identified as a place of tension. And that tension was a demand for emotional responsibility and an attempt to be in control of their self and for other people. It could require years as an adult before a parentally inverted person can learn at the deepest heart level to mature into the reality of the Proverbs 31 woman that we read about. In Proverbs 31, 11, it says, The heart of her husband does safely trust in her. Rest for the parentally inverted person becomes identified with solitude or fun away from the home. It's a strain and an added discipline 
to learn how to find rest among the primary people in a perennially inverted person's life. So we have to have compassion for this person. If you're the one who's praying for somebody who's displaying these kind of symptoms, where they're overly controlling as an adult, they're always stepping in and appear to be even overstepping their authority and trying to resolve conflicts because they're just so uncomfortable. Instead of judging that person, we have to have compassion because they grew up in a home that was very unstable, typically. It's not always the case, but typically. And they just got so conditioned to always kicking into this mode whenever there's any kind of disagreement that we have to have compassion on them and pray with them. So in the home, that reminds them of how it's having to be in charge so they can't rest in the home and they can't rest among primary people, spouses and children, because they're afraid of this demand. So they tend to like to be alone and can't rest in another person. They can't trust that the other person can carry them because they're always so used to carrying everyone else. He didn't learn in the home that somebody else is available to carry me. Instead, he's always going to want to care for the other person thus effectively holding the other person at a safe distance from the heart, lacking intimacy. Parentally inverted people need to be taught to resign over and over again from the general managership of the universe and to discover with gleeful chagrin that somehow God manages to get along without their help. Again, the antidote is repentance and forgiveness. The blood of Jesus will wash away resentments from the heart of that inner child, God's perfect love will cast away the hidden fears which have propelled the overstriving, and the cross will affect death of the structures. You'll hear us talk about structures over and over again, whether it's performance orientation, parental inversion, bitter root judgments. These are all structures that we built in order to cope with the conditions that we faced in our lives, but they weren't God-given structures. They were coping mechanisms. Now, he understands why they got there, but he loves us too much for us to continue to lean on those structures. So he'll give us time, and he'll allow us to deconstruct those with his help. But if life continues to go on decade after decade, he's going to increase his intensity. This is a good, loving father wants to do this. So those structures get removed. Jesus was a carpenter, right? So he would not have built on rotted wood. He's going to remove the rotted structure, and he's going to lay a foundation with new wood, with new materials. And that's what God wants to do. He wants us to dig down to our foundations. If there's any rotted structure in there, like parental inversion, he wants it out. Not fixed, crucified, taken to the cross so that he can resurrect us on the other side, whole, so the cross will affect the death of that resultant structure. One of those structures is just being busy. Apparently inverted people have a hard time relaxing. That self-suffering stance they have of being a martyr. They like to control. They put other people down. Those all may need to be seen and dealt with one by one. Each one of those structures or may simply wither and die away as the deeper tap roots are dealt with. So as God is exposing through the Holy Spirit, through love, through ministry, through revelation, some of those things just automatically fall away because the root was destroyed at the cross and the busyness now all of a sudden falls away. The presence of the Father will heal and restore the tired and untrusting heart of that perennially inverted person. And we could think of Joseph. He's not always thought of in this light, but we can go back to Genesis and just look at Joseph's life for a minute, understand that his brothers treated him so harshly. He was shown favoritism by his father, which wasn't his fault, but that was the circumstance. It wasn't Joseph's fault, but yet part of his childhood was robbed. We don't know exactly how old he was when he was sold off into slavery, but he didn't get to live that normal, happy family life. He was hated by his brothers, almost killed, and then sold off into slavery. Genesis 35, 23 says the sons of Leah were Reuben, Jacob's firstborn, and Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, and Zebulun. The sons of Rachel were Joseph and Benjamin. So right there, we know one of the reasons his brothers had animosity towards Joseph was because his mom was Rachel, and his dad loved Rachel. That was the one that he wanted to marry all along. Leah was the one that was married first and was not the first choice. So naturally, well, I shouldn't say naturally, it's not natural, but he did show favoritism towards Joseph and Benjamin because they were the children of the wife that he loved. So there's already all this tangle happening in the family. If we fast forward to Genesis 42, verse 13, 
We know what happened. Joseph did not die. He sold into slavery, put into prison, but he gets promoted by the Lord because of the favor on his life, and now he's second in command of the country. Things appear to be going very well in his life. From a secular standpoint, he was prospering, but he still had undealt with issues in his heart. And it's not hard for us to see why. He didn't fully forgive his brothers, and and we can come to that conclusion because he knew there was a famine coming. That was one of the reasons that he had so much favor on his life is because he interpreted dreams and he made predictions that were true and told Pharaoh he needed to store up for seven years because seven years of famine were coming. But what we don't see in Scripture is Joseph calling for his family to leave Israel and come to Egypt to be saved from the famine. He ignores them, basically, because of the pain that was in his life. He was now in Egypt, and he was prospering. They were back in Israel, and he knew the famine was coming. So when a situation like this happens, because God loves us, and he loves us too much to leave us in the condition that we're in, he wants us to continue to grow and change. If Joseph is not going to send for his brothers, God is going to bring the brothers to Joseph. And that's going to help uncover some of the pain that he hasn't dealt with. So Genesis 42, verse 13, picking up in the middle of the story, the brothers are there, and they're, they're now talking to an official. They don't know it's their brother Joseph. They're talking to an official in Egypt. They said, there, verse 13, your servants are 12 brothers, the sons of one man in the land of Canaan. And in fact, the youngest, Benjamin, is with our father today, and one is no more. Little did they know they were talking to Joseph, the one they were referring to as no more. They thought he was dead. They're speaking to him. Joseph says to them, you are spies. In this manner, you'll be tested. By the life of Pharaoh, you shall not leave this place unless your youngest brother comes here. We now have the advantage, in retrospect, looking back all these years later, of knowing that Joseph was longing to see his brother Benjamin. They had the same mom. That was his blood brother, full blood brother, was Benjamin, and yet he wasn't there with the brothers that were in Egypt. So he concocted the scheme of accusing them of being spies because he so wanted them to call back his brother so he could see Benjamin. We don't know if Joseph and Benjamin might have looked like their mom. So in Joseph's heart, maybe seeing his brother would have reminded him of his mom, who we know passed at Benjamin's birth. All of these undealt with issues in Joseph's heart are now coming to the surface. He could have easily kept functioning as a second in command of the whole country. But as I said, God loved him too much for that to just continue to go undealt with. And God loves you too much and me too much for us to continue to just function in life. Well, we're saved. We have a job. We're paying our bills. Things look like they're going well. No, that's not the full abundant life that he wants us to have. So later on in Genesis 43, it says, When Joseph came home, the brothers brought him the present which was in their hand into the house and bowed down before him to the earth. He asked them about their well-being, said, Is your father well, the old man of whom you spoke? Is he still alive? They answered, Yes, your servant, our father, is in good health. He's still alive. They bowed their heads down and prostrated themselves. And then he lifted his eyes and saw his brother Benjamin. How ironic. The very dream that they were upset with when they first cast him into the pit was the dream that Joseph had that they would bow down. And now that very dream is coming to pass in reality. But what's on Joseph's mind is not the fulfillment of the dream. It's the fact that he can now see his brother Benjamin. And the Bible says he lifted his eyes, saw his brother Benjamin, his mother's son, and said, is this your younger brother of whom you spoke to me? And he said, God, be gracious to you, my son. Now his heart yearned for his brother. So Joseph made haste and sought somewhere to weep. And he went into his chamber and he wept there. We can have compassion on Joseph. We can understand so many years had gone by. So many times he must have questioned, why would they do this to me? Why would they cast me into the pit? Why was I sold off into slavery? Why did I get into Potiphar's house and his wife accused me of raping her and and then get thrown into jail? All those years of pain and and trials that he had to walk through. And there was pain in his heart that hadn't been dealt with. There's pain in our hearts that haven't been dealt with. And God loves us too much to leave it there because it's causing us to walk with an emotional limp. In some ways, we're still crippled. If you grew up in a parentally inverted home, there might be some forgiveness that needs to go on towards your parents. You're saying, no, it was no big deal. I did it. I I bucked up under the pressure, and I served the way I needed to. 
And that's good that you did that. But if there's resentment in your heart, if you're holding resentment, that's acting as poison. Just like in Joseph's heart, there was poison in there. And we know that because he wept when he saw his brother Benjamin. He, he wept. There was an undealt with part of his heart that hadn't fully forgiven. And that's not a bad thing. It's a good thing that God loved him enough to bring the brothers to him so that it wouldn't stay in there and act like a poison in his system. All right, we're going to move on. Psalm 61, verse 2. So with my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. That's what happens. He brings things back to our remembrance through Scripture, through Holy Spirit, these areas where there's a void in our lives. And when our heart gets overwhelmed, we say, Lord, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. This person who hurt me, whether it was my parents or someone else, I made it. I got through that problem, but I haven't fully forgiven them. And it's really hard for me right now to, to have the strength to be able to forgive them. So lead me to the rock that is higher than I. I don't want to carry this bitterness in my heart anymore and the resentment that I'm feeling towards the people who put this load on me when I was too young to carry that load. Back to the book, uh, quoting from John Sanford, he says, Sometimes when one parent fails or is gone from the home, one of the children, usually the eldest of the opposite sex, steps in to fill the vacant spot. A son may become the breadwinner. So now we're talking about the substitute mate piece, right? We talked about parental inversion, and now we're talking about substitute mate. The eldest son, in this example, steps in and becomes the breadwinner. The father's divorced, the father left, and now the eldest son steps in. He may become the mother's confidant or her strength to lean upon. He may discipline the younger children. In short, in one degree or another, he may set about to run the household in his father's place. That puts him in the position of a husband, but without the bed. Nevertheless, all these little shadings and nuance of meaning and practice feelings between the mom and her now missing husband starts to flow to the son. And an undercurrent starts to develop between the mother and the son. Even if the mother never lets herself think a sexual thought towards the son, he's in the position and a stimulus starts to flow just by virtue of the fact that he's in that position. And even if the son never thinks a sexual thought towards his mother, he still must unconsciously turn off these feelings that are happening on the inside of him that is just part of how God wired him. The deep mind's unvoiced thought is, this is my mother. I can't think or feel this way towards her. Or he may have conscious feelings and consciously have to refuse them, right? So it's one thing, if he doesn't recognize it, let's assume it's a 15-year-old boy. It's another thing, he does recognize it. It's a conscious feeling, and he consciously has to step away because something's happened inside of him, and he knows it's not right of a feeling towards his mom. What that would result in is a pattern of withdrawal and shutting down a built-in system that God put in that boy's heart. But now he's been tainted in a way that causes him to want to shut down sexual feelings. And it goes down into what John Sanford calls subterranean passages of the heart. Later in life, that boy grows up and becomes a man and he's a model, responsible husband. He knows he has to be a strength for his wife. But what may happen is that suddenly and unaccountably to him, he may be unable to make love to his wife. It's not because he's impotent, but he's been turned off. There's a switch that was thrown in his 15-year-old heart that he's not even aware of. Something's blocking him, and he can't even imagine what it is. But the block was that built-in turn-off mechanism that activated the moment his wife became a mother. I won't say that happens every time, of course, but... I quoted from Psalm 139 before, and I'll say it again. We are fearfully and wonderfully made. And if in our childhood our wires get crossed, that there are cracks in that structure because of parental inversion or many of the other things we talk about, this boy, who's now a man, is unable to relate properly with his wife because of something that happened many years ago. That's got to be identified. Holy Spirit has to help bring those things to the surface so that can be brought to the cross And he can be resurrected on the other side of the cross with a healthy view towards his wife. Quoted from the book, he's talking about projection now. Identification, a a projection identification process is activated in this boy who's now a man. And he's projecting onto his wife the way he shut down his feelings towards his mother. 
Each person's got to then be helped to break out of that old mold and find and build into himself a new identity in Christ. He does not so much try to build a new self as to discover and celebrate the new identity, resurrecting out of that old identity. Thus appreciate and praising God for what he's doing and making him new. I'll just pause for a second. I'm not quoting now. I'm just telling you this is a principle that we'll talk about often. Many people feel like, well, my life was so messed up. I had so much trauma when I was growing up. Wouldn't it have been better if God could just hit the erase button and cause all those memories to be gone because nothing good could have come out of that? And we want to encourage you that's not true. God is so awesome and so great that he takes those broken things from our childhood, from our lives. All of us have some form of it. And he now shows his glory through those broken things in our adult life, in our sanctified version of who he created us to be on this side of the cross. And he gives us authority to be able to minister to other people in those very same areas that the devil tried to use to destroy us. So in this boy's case, as an adult now, as he gets whole and he gets delivered from uh, this counterfeit structure that was in his life called parental inversion, he can appreciate and praise God for how God is making him new in that area, healing the first and deepest hurt and a lack of ability to trust God the Father because his own father abandoned him. The concepts of parental inversion and substitute mate are simple. We can easily see how such patterns are formed in the heart. But what's not easy is to overcome those structures once they're fully installed. Here again, the person receiving ministry must take firm hold of his own healing. Parental inversion is not an easy thing to hate as sin. The difficulty is that it's become a most noble definition of life. The whole purpose of life may be invested in it. We can even justify it with scripture. John 15, 13 says, Greater love has no one than this than one lay down his life for another. Our entire life, if we're parentally inverted, has been a commitment to serve. That would be really hard to see that as sin. Our serving wasn't wrong. It's never been wrong. God wants to reward us for the service, but our motive for the serving wasn't pure. And that impurity made some of our serving as much or more damaging than it was helpful. And it's for that wrong motivation that the Lord calls us to death. And believe me, it's a good death. We'll most likely never stop serving God loves us for it. In John 15, 14, he said, you're my friends if you do what I command you. But our death will mean that the corruptions of the flesh will die and fade away from our serving. So we won't be doing it from the wrong motive. We'll be doing it from, not because the world's falling apart and I have to fix something, but we'll just be serving with proper boundaries. Striving will die and it'll be the Holy Spirit who prompts and checks what we do, not the compulsions of our flesh. Parental inversion and substitute mate are not simply attitudes, they're habitual structures. That prayer might initiate a struggle, right? When we first start to listen to these CDs, these things have been laying dormant for decades, potentially. Doesn't finish the problem or deal with the problem, it just initiates the struggle. And we'll be called on time and time again to check those habitual thoughtless responses that we've been so conditioned to do. A parentally inverted person must be willing to hear the frequent admonitions and rebukes of friends. Ephesians 4.15 says, We speak the truth in love and we're to grow up in all aspects into him who's the head, even Christ. No one likes to hear rebuke, but scripture's clear about it. Stern discipline, this is Proverbs 15.10, is for him who forsakes the way. He who hates reproof will die. It's difficult enough to rebuke someone who's obviously doing wrong, it's much more difficult to correct someone who's trying to be helpful. Proverbs 27, 6 is truly faithful are the wounds of a friend, profuse are the kisses of an enemy. In short, parental inversion and substitute made are practices of the flesh about which the Lord has far more compassion than most. To be corrected is to be rewarded. God has chosen to set us free and he wants to bless us. Freedom means that the Holy Spirit will serve through us restfully though perhaps more actively than before, and he'll observe those checkpoints and give us wisdom to serve in a way that blesses people. So what I'm going to do is just give you a case study now from one of the Sanford's books. Uh, It's not an easy one to listen to because it's painful to hear what happened, but I think it does a wonderful job of showing how difficult and how cross the wiring gets for the children in a family 
where there's parental inversion, where they're required to take on more weight than they're able to handle. And to add to that, in this particular case, there was also sexual abuse that took place, which I realize is a very difficult topic for some of us listening to these CDs and this teaching because we might have experienced it ourselves. It's such a common problem to have experienced sexual abuse. But I think you'll understand why I'm bringing it out as I go along through it. And we're just praying that the Lord will give you the grace to listen and receive what he wants to teach you through this and what the Sanfords learned through it as well. And, and just the amazing grace that the people that are involved in it have been able to walk in because of the Lord. So Paula Sanford is given a case study and the lady that she's speaking about, the mom in the story is named Linda. She says, Linda was a lovely, gentle woman who John and I had known well for many years. Her marriage to Bill was written in tension dictated by his frequent explosions of violent, unexplainable temper and punctuated by her tearful but persistent and often placating attempts to gather the broken but still workable pieces of their home life together for the sake of their children. Though Bill professed to be a born-again, spirit-filled Christian, he had fallen into adultery numerous times. He had begged for forgiveness and he had declared vehemently on each occasion that he was repentant that he had learned his lesson, and that he would never fall again. Finally, when he was caught seducing a teenage babysitter, Linda recognized that he could never change until he dealt with the deep issues in his heart. But he stubbornly avoided taking the initiative to submit himself to a counselor, even though friends and family strongly encouraged him. It was not until Linda obtained a legal separation that he relented by agreeing to receive extensive counseling. That was the prerequisite for any thought of reconciliation. John and I had ministered to the two of them from time to time as much as Bill had been able to allow, but we had seen that he was always more interested in patching a quarrel than in truly healing his marriage or transforming his life. Knowing that we were too close to Linda to counsel them with sufficient objectivity, we recommended that they go to a couple we knew who were among the finest counselors available in either the Christian or the secular community. During the ensuing seven months, Bill faced many of the root causes for his insecurities and his need to defile women. I'm just going to pause here for a minute. This is not Paul quoting now. It's just me, Peter Roselli, speaking. You can see what an unstable home life this is, right? There's constant arguing going on. There's been problem with sexual sins because of the dad. The children haven't really been mentioned much yet, but we're going to learn that there's three children in this family. And this, I'm not picking on this family because everybody has some issues that they're dealing with, but... Mom is trying to be the noble person and continue to forgive her husband in order to keep the family together. But until there's some way, a sanctified Jesus, Holy Spirit kind of way to get to the roots, they just keep circling around in the same destructive behavior patterns. And in some ways, she's being an enabler to the husband because she hasn't taken a firmer stand up until now. She's taken the stand and asking and demanding that he gets counseling. But you notice what Paula said he only seemed to want to patch the quarrel, not to get to the deepest roots. So back to the quote again. It says, During the ensuing seven months, Bill faced many of the root causes for his insecurities and his need to defile women. He dealt with a number of basic sources for his anger. His counselors determined that he had progressed far enough to return to his family. For a period of time, he was able to manifest the effects of his healing, and Linda, for the first time, began to celebrate real hope for a stable marriage. It was at this point that Bill decided that he could sustain his new life on his own without counseling or support group. We're going to pause again for a minute because I have to just say this is really scary. When people do this, they think they're farther along than they really are. And this man, Bill, decides on his own that he's just going to stop the counseling and not have any support group any longer. And most of the time, in my experience, that is way too soon because... They don't like the fact of having to be held accountable. They might have dealt with some of the roots. It's not that they haven't made any progress, but there's more layers of the onion that have to be peeled back in order to really get to all those cancer cells. If we can use that analogy, there's still cancer cells in the system, but he's aborting the process too quickly. Back to the quote again. His healing process was aborted. He continued to play the role of the new man, making all the right sounds, but allowed no one to relate closely enough to know him or to haul him to account when he began to fall back periodically into former patterns of irritability and temper. Bill and Linda's 14-year-old daughter, Karen, 
who had always been a responsible, sensitive, loving child and a good student, began to exhibit rebellious, irresponsible behavior. Truancy and unexplained absences from home grew in frequency. Often Linda would arrive home from work to discover that Karen, the daughter, the 14-year-old daughter, was nowhere to be found. Attempts to enforce discipline elicited an angry and defensive outburst from Karen. When anyone invited Karen to talk to her about problems, she defiantly rejected every attempt to reach her and retreated into sullen moodiness. Finally, and with great difficulty, she came to her mother with a horrible story of sexual abuse. Her father had been molesting her since the time of her parents' separation, which meant that she was being abused all during the time of counseling and reconciliation that was going on. Shattered, torn, fearful, and confused, Linda, the mom, confronted her husband. Bill adamantly denied all accusations, claiming that Karen's imagination was running away with her, that she had been unduly influenced by the stories of friends who had been abused, and he went on dramatically playing the role of an injured party, and Linda didn't know who or what to believe. Finally, after repeated questioning, Bill confessed to having touched her, quote-unquote, once or twice, quote-unquote. As Karen's behavior progressed more and more to the extreme, however, it became evident that he was guilty of much more than he had been willing to confess. Realization of what had been taking place for years within her home overwhelmed Linda with the force of a tidal wave. She wanted so desperately to believe that Bill was changing and had so set herself to celebrate every little sign of his improvement that she had shut out the little signals which might otherwise have alerted her to the presence of trouble. Now she had no alternative but to put him out of the home just to protect Karen. I'm going to pause again for a minute. I'm not reading now. I'm just telling you. Again, we're getting a window into a picture of a very, very dysfunctional home. There might not have been sexual abuse in your home or in the home of the person that we're talking to, but there's dysfunction. There's some kind of erratic behavior. There's a lack of stability. That's the point that we want to get across the most here is that lack of consistent rules. Like we said when we started, children need consistent sets of boundaries and rules. And when there's this kind of instability that we're seeing that Linda experienced with her husband, Bill, it's going to ripple down to Karen and Karen's two brothers. Linda and the children proceeded with family counseling through most of the next year and received a great deal of healing from that source as well as through support groups within her church. Today, Bill's receiving counsel for sexual rehabilitation while serving a term in prison. He and Linda are divorced. She and the children have rebonded, and the Lord is blessing and redeeming their lives as only he can. Again, I'll pause for a second from the story because this is really where the parental inversion piece comes in. You've heard the sordid details of this family, a husband first cheating on his wife and then sexually molesting their 14-year-old daughter. The incredible negative impact that would have on young Karen. And she's also got two little brothers. Once the father goes to prison, now we have a home where there's a mom, a very wounded 14-year-old daughter, and two younger brothers. And this is where the parental inversion piece comes in because these two young guys now don't have a dad in the home and they're gonna be asked to carry more of a load than two young boys should have to carry. And I don't mean at all to ignore Karen's needs. She's got a huge amount of healing that she needs from the sexual molestation from her own dad. So Psalm 55 verse four says, my heart is severely pained within me and the terrors of death have befallen me. Fearfulness and trembling have come upon me, and horror has overwhelmed me. So I said, oh, that I had wings like a dove. I would fly away and be at rest. Indeed, I would wander far off and remain in the wilderness. I would hasten my escape from the windy storm and tempest. Verse 12 says, for it is not an enemy who reproaches me. Then I could bear it. Nor is it one who hates me who has exalted himself against me. Then I could hide from it. But it was you a man my equal, my companion and my acquaintance. We took sweet counsel together and walked to the house of God in the throng. Verse 16, but I call to God and the Lord saves me. Verse 18, he ransoms me unharmed from the battle waged against me, even though many oppose me. What an incredible psalm. This is talking about betrayal. Somebody who I knew who betrayed me. It's one thing if it was a stranger, it still would hurt, but the fact that it was somebody I knew 
And that is such a common denominator for so many of us with the trauma that we face in our lives. It's been displayed very clearly in this example of Bill and Linda and their children, where a girl's father sexually abuses her and then goes to jail and leaves the family to have to fend for themselves. So there's so many emotions that are rising up, and it's easy for parental inversion and substitute mate to enter into a situation like this. I'm going to continue reading from the Sanfords, um, from Paula's testimony about this story of this family. Thankfully, God still brings restoration in the midst of all these problems. Paula says, my question to Linda was, can you tell me what you've been through? Can you share what you have been feeling? And Paula says, I'm not going to elaborate on her words, but rather trust that the Lord will enable you, the listener, to empathize in the simplicity and straightforwardness of Linda's testimony. She said so poetically that I put it here in free verse the way she said it. Linda said, when I found out what Bill had done, I felt like I was caught in a complicated web. It was so unbelievable, so tremendously big, I couldn't comprehend it. I was in shock. I went through the motions of doing what I knew I had to do. I put him out. At first I thought, Bill's sin is against Karen, not me. But several weeks later, reality sank in. The sick lies he told me, the deception, it all hit me like a brick. Trust was shattered. The past six years had been a lie. I was angry. I felt like a patsy, gullible, betrayed. It hit my mother bear instinct. I should have been there to see, to protect, and to react. But I'd failed. I was angry at myself for being so blind and trusting. I was so confused. Their stories were so conflicting. Bill said one thing, Karen said something else, but her actions said that he did what she said he did, even though he said he did not do it. I knew she was telling the truth. I had to face my anger and let that anger live. I banged on pillows, dragging out years of swallowed anger, expressing it and feeling it. And all the while, Karen was treating me like the villain, continuing to punish me. She said, you should have known, Mom. I shouldn't have had to tell you. Now, Linda speaking, I wondered, can I really say I didn't see? I could remember Bill playing around with her, grabbing her in a hug like he'd always done with the kids, but, but then sometimes I'd see him touch her breasts, and I'd say, watch out, Bill, you have to be careful. And he'd stop and say, oh, yeah. I had to face some mixed feelings about Karen, too. I loved her so much. She's my daughter. But I had to deal with my anger. She, my own daughter, had become the other woman. She had aced me out just by being Mostly I was angry that something could go on so long. I just finished blowing my whole life. No control. Nobody told me. I felt betrayed on all sides. Helpless. Loneliness overwhelmed me for a while. And I was blown away, looking for security. Somebody who'd tell me everything would be okay. I was so vulnerable. and had such a lack of discernment. So shattered. No confidence at all in my ability to see. I really lost it for a while. I even had a crush on my counselor. He said we were mutually attracted, but he wasn't available. Then there was a string of others, all authority figures, who did want to be available. Absolutely everything in my life was shaken to the roots and had to be built up again. Moral structures and everything, especially since I hadn't really resolved my individuation before I was married. Just as a side note for you folks, this is not a quote from the story now, but individuation just is a term that's used in counseling for people being able to stand on their own two feet and fully becoming a person who can make their own decisions. So a lack of individuation just means that you are vulnerable to being taken advantage of. That's one of many things it means. But back to the story. Linda says, for a while my boys were putting a lot of pressure on Bill and me to kiss and make up. Joey would still be like that. That's the youngest son. But Matt, the older brother, understands. Joey's younger and he just loves his dad and can't understand why mommy doesn't. I've been in a bind. I could tell the boys the truth and destroy the image of the bad guy. So when Bill wasn't paying child support or paying his bills and he was feeding the kids a line about how I had all his money, I could lay out the facts. But I told them that their daddy was sick and his actions were not deliberate, that he was not a bad guy that he needs help and he needs healing. 
Our 13-year-old Matt has been very angry, very defensive, fiercely loyal to his father and parentally inverted. He tries to be a father to his father and sticks up for him whenever anyone says anything negative about him. Both of the boys want so much to believe that when Bill says Sonny, he really means it. I can forgive Bill, but I can't be a wife to him again. Trust and respect are gone. Matt wanted to tell how he felt to Paula Sanford because he said maybe it'll help some other kid. He wanted to be asked specific questions. So Paula asked him, what was your reaction when you first heard about what your dad had done? Matt said, I didn't believe it. I said, I don't care. My dad wouldn't have done anything like that. Paula said, what made you believe it? Matt said, the evidence, the separation, the court. He confessed. Paula said, how did that make you feel, Matt? Matt said, like glass, shattered. Respect, dependability, but it didn't even seem real. More like a nightmare he'd want to wake up from. Paula said, how did you feel when he had to go to jail? Matt said, I felt sorry for him, that he wouldn't have a life, no freedom, no fun. Paula said, do you believe the jail will do him any good? Matt said, yeah, maybe. Maybe it'll make him grow up, give him time to think, help him separate fact from fantasy. He has to go to a counselor now. Paula said, what's the most important message that you'd like to send to your dad? 13-year-old Matt said, that I'll always love him no matter what. Paula said, what's the best wish that you would make for him, the most important prayer that you would say for him? Matt said, that he would grow up. Paula said, sometimes you're awfully angry. Who were you angry with? Matt said, my dad. Paula said, are you angry at Karen? Matt said, no, she didn't do anything. Dad did it to her. Are you angry with your mom? Well, you know how you get angry with moms, he laughed. But I'm not angry with her about, you know, I don't blame her. Paula said, Matt, you've had trouble sleeping. Why is that? He said, I keep thinking about my dad, about things I'd like to do with him. Paula said, do you worry about how other people feel about your dad? Matt said, I don't want him to lose friends. I don't want people to not like him or think he's a weirdo. Paula said, how's Joey doing? Matt said, he thinks the judge was mean to put dad in jail. He just wants to be with him. Paula said, does Joey kind of look to you as a dad now? Matt said, I am his dad. Linda smiled appreciatively and tenderly and said, Matt, you have uncles and grandparents. Let them be dads. You just keep on doing a super job of being a big brother. Now Paula commenting said, I watched Big Brother in operation one day not long ago. He was supervising the writing of Joey's letter to dad in prison. Joey sat with pencil poised and staring off into space and Matt tried to hurry him. Joey objected, I'm thinking. Matt said, you don't have to think. Just write, dear dad, I love you. Joey started, wrote a word or two and spaced out again. Matt said, come on, Joey, keep going, keep going. Finally, Joey's letter was completed. Dear dad, I love you, I am sad for you. The only adverb Joey could think of for his homework assignment was sadly. But Matt will be there to keep him going and God and Linda and the rest of the family and the church are faithfully and lovingly there to keep Matt going and to see that he has some time to just be a kid. This is a family moving ahead in the Lord's healing process. Despite substantial difficulties, new life is opening beautifully before them. They've made choices to forgive and to love unconditionally. Despite their sometimes screaming feelings, I'd like to kill Bill. And the Lord has caused those repeated choices to become a reality that opens doors to continued healing and blessing. The message version of Romans chapter 2, verse 1, says, Every time you criticize someone, you condemn yourself. It takes one to know one. 
judgmental criticism of others is a well-known way of escaping detection in your own crimes and misdemeanors. But God isn't so easily diverted. He sees right through all such smoke screens and holds you to what you've done. You didn't think, did you, that just by pointing your finger at others, you would distract God from seeing all your misdoings and from coming down on you hard. Verse 4 of Romans 2 says, Or did you think that because he's such a nice God, he'd let you off the hook? Better think this one through from the beginning. God is kind, but he's not soft. In kindness, he takes us firmly by the hand and leads us into a radical life change. All right, so as we wrap up the teaching on parental inversion and substitute made, I want to take another quote from the Sanfords. It said, parentally inverted individuals are moved by a concern of making things better in the family and in the world. In this sense, they're truly others-centered, take an undue responsibility for the well-being of those around them. That's why without understanding their own motives, parentally inverted people can hardly bear to hear that their actions might hurt instead of help. They might smother people instead of giving life. We must not accuse them of selfishness, for that would be unjust. Instead, we must gently minister truth to these wounded hearts who try so hard to fix the world around them. And we'll end with a prayer that the Sanfords recommend to people who are dealing with parental inversion and substitute mate. And I'll say it as if it were specific to the case that we just read with Linda and Bill. We could say the prayer as if we were looking through Matt's eyes many years later when we saw him in this story. He was only 13 years old, but we could picture him going through high school and college and getting saved and coming to a church and hearing all the good news about the gospel and not realizing that so much of his life when he was a teenager had these cracks in the foundation and why. And that's a common problem that we see. We meet wonderful people that are great Christians, but never made the connection between current problems and things that happened to them in their childhood. So as you pray this prayer or you listen to me as I say it and then you substitute your own information in here, have compassion for the hurting, be able to forgive those who hurt you and just allow the Holy Spirit to minister to your heart. So as if Matt was saying this prayer, I would say, Father, I thank you for caring enough for me to pursue me, to help me see that in my family, the parental roles came to be reversed. I see that I stepped in to fill the gap, and regardless of how necessary or how noble that may have seemed, I recognize I was wrong in usurping my father Bill's role in trying to help raise my brother Joey. I denied my own childhood. You did not design my child's shoulders to carry such a heavy weight. Lord, I forgive my parents. I forgive my mom for not being there to protect Karen and for allowing this thing to go on for so long to the point where Bill had to go to jail. I forgive Bill for just not dealing with his own problems and allowing it to so impact our family and to ruin my sister the way he did. I confess that I've judged them. I hated them both at one point in my life for just not being normal parents, for just not giving me a normal house to grow up in. I ask you to forgive me for those judgments and the bitterness they built in my heart. I also confess that I judge you, God, as being weak, somebody who needed my help. I thought I had to do it for you. Forgive me for wounding you in that way. I've avoided intimacy and avoided getting involved in corporateness, being involved in church community. Father, forgive me for the way I've cut myself off from emotion. I know I did it as a child so that I could function, but now it's like a defense mechanism in my life, and I've hurt many people with my inability to feel. Forgive me for trying to take over for you and so control my spouse and my world. I resign, Lord. I'm not in charge. Father, it frightens me to ask you to take charge of me and those I love and work with, but I'm tired. Bring my fear and my pride to death. I want to trust in you, to rest in you. I ask you to speak peace into my inner being and calm my striving, even as you calm the sea. 